you all for coming today. Um, so like you said, my name is Diana. I'm currently studying mathematics at the university in my second year. Uh, today I'll be speaking about um, uh, investment banks and what it takes to be an investment banker and then exploring one of the key qualities of a banker, which is understanding financial models. We will look at simple market models and it will become obvious how mathematics plays a large role in this. So what is an investment bank? So I'm just going to start off kind of defining things just in case some of you don't know what an investment bank is. So investment banking is a special segment of banking operation that helps individuals or organizations raise capital and provide financial consultancy services to them. So I'm not sure if any of you have heard of investment bank, but it's quite different to our typical commercial banks. So the commercial banks are the retail banks that we know. So that's like Barclays that we all have a bank card to, or Lloyds, or HSBC, or any of those banks. And it's different um, to an investment bank in terms of the fact that ex um, investment banks, um, they expedite the purchase of sales of bonds, stocks, and other investments, and aid companies in making initial public offering, IPOs. And IPOs are basically, um, if you've got a new company and it wants to expand, but it doesn't have the funds to expand. It needs investors, so the company um, will share its, will sell its shares to investors, and over time, um, it can buy back the shares. But in selling those shares, it will be able to accumulate capital in order to, um, so that it can grow its business. Um, whereas commercial banks, which are the retail banks that we know, uh, act as managers for deposit accounts for businesses and individuals although they are primarily focused on business accounts and they make um, public loans through deposit money that they hold. So if you wanted to take out a loan, you'd go to your retail bank. So in terms of the day-to-day -day interaction with pe um, people, we don't really interact with an investment bank. That's more the commercial bank, which we all know. And these are the four um, aspects to an investment bank. So you've got capital market, M&A, which is mergers and acquisition, sales and trading, and asset management. M&A um, is the more kind of known um, aspect of an investment bank. It's more, um, it's more what is advertised on the news. So um, one of the recent examples is the Tesla uh, car company. And um, so they, they sell electric cars. And the, uh, recently, they've um, been interested in uh, merging with SolarCity. And, the Solar City is a company that sell uh, solar panels, and as part of the merger, um, Tesla wants to uh, merge with Solar City and uh, invest in the solar panels, and they want to kind of um, build houses with these amazing roof tiles, and these roof tiles also are solar panels, and it's kind of quite technologically advanced, and it would give Tesla a really good brand image. But obviously, with every kind of merger and acquisition, there's always a downside to it. And with, with Tesla merging with uh, SolarCity, it would also acquire a $3 million debt. So um, the, the shareholders would decide on the 17th of November whether they want to go on with this uh, merge or not. So obviously, there's good and bad to it. Um, these are some of the investment banks which we have today. Um, so you've got the big banks such as Goldman Sachs, HSBC that we all know. Um, Barclays is commercial bank and investment bank. So you've got a mixture here. And then you've also got the more independent banks such as Lazard. And they're kind of called boutique banks. And um, they're more kind of specialist banks. And they deal with um, more kind of well-known mergers and acquisitions. Uh, Lazard is quite famous for that. So um, although they all are investment banks, they all kind of specialize in certain things where, um, for instance, Morgan Stanley uh, uh, has a, the biggest um, wealth management sector. So it's just uh, the kind of dealing with individual clients who have a lot of, who have a high net worth and helping them invest their money and manage their money. So we kind of have talked a bit about investment banks. And now I want to move on to the actual people who work inside the investment banks. I always found them quite interesting. It's quite like an interesting environment to work in. And I always wondered who were the investment bankers within these uh, invest investment banks. So I searched on in Google uh, Images 
and these are the images I got for investment bankers. So clearly, um, we can see it has a lot to do with money. Um, it's quite a technical job, it's quite a technical field. Um, you've got Leonardo DiCaprio from The Wolf of Wall Street, I'm not sure if any of you have watched that, but um, it's quite a good film, I recommend it, and it kind of gives you an impression of the kind of exuberant side of investment banking and kind of the lifestyle that comes with it. It's a bit exaggerated, it's more kind of how it started off as, but it's, it's still good nonetheless. Um, you can clearly see from this picture, it's kind of like a hands-on job. You've got the presenting, the, the obviously dealing with the data, and just like the day-to-day -day, um, client, uh, uh, client service. So who are these investment bankers that we see in the pictures? Um, well, Investopedia defines investment bankers to um, play a role in helping clients raise capital to finance various activities and grow the businesses. So they are financial advisory intermediaries who help raise capital and allocate it to various users. So you've got your investment bankers and you've got the clients. And um, the clients want to raise capital for whatever use they may have. And um, it may be too, for instance, they want to build a house in the future and they want to gradually grow um, the capital in order to finance their dreams and aspirations or their dreams may be to, they want to start a business right now, they want to either start it up or uh, grow it, they may be an IPO. Um, so yeah, so this is what uh, investment bankers do. So they do fulfill the role of investment bank. And how do they make their money? Um, well, they make their money by selling services to clients such as companies, governments, and investment funds. They are paid for these services through fees and commissions. And today I would like you to step into the shoes of an investment banker because um, I really want to get an idea of your kind of uh, risk and what kind of risk you would take and what kind of investments you personally would take because every investment banker would be different and every investment banker will be taking different um, kinds of risks. Um, and according to eFinance, these are the qualities you're expected to have as an investment banker. So you're supposed to be very academically gifted. Um, you're supposed to have a, a load of experience with internships, president of your finance society, um, your characteristics, you have to be focused, charming, willing to travel, resilient, you will need resilience because things don't always go to plan with banking. And the, the um, characteristics we'll be focusing mostly today is an expert in financial modeling. Well, before we move on to that, I um, just wanted to define some key terms. There are, it's, all, always, it's obviously a very technical field, but um, the, the two key terms I want you to be familiar with today is stock and bond. Um, they're just kind of they're just kind of um, more specific to the presentation. So the stock market is different uh, to the bond market in terms of the stock market is where you um, an investor will issue a shares of a company to other investors, whereas the bond market is more loanership. So it's where the investor loans out money at an interest rate or variable, and as you can imagine, this will grow quite. Um, quite quickly, depending on how large the interest rate is or how large the fixed variable is. Moving on to uh, starting our market model, which is what we're here to do. We're here to use maths and apply it. Um, suppose that, you ha that two assets are traded. One is risk-free and one is a risky security. The risk-free can be thought of as a bank deposit or a bond issued by a government a financial institution or a company. The risky security will typically be some stock. It may also be foreign currency, gold, um, a commodity or virtually any future price um, who's, uh, which is unknown from today. So we, have, uh, we will have two time zones. We have t equals zero, which is the time today, and t equals one, which is the future uh, date. And t equals, well, there's obviously more than uh, just two dates. But um, we're going to keep it quite simple today. And um, the T equals 1 could be a year, it could be a month, a week, or even 
we, we saw today that overnight the markets have changed due to the election, so um, it changes daily, so it's really quite interesting to monitor. Um, so the risky securities can be specified uh, as the number of shares of stock held by the investor, and we will denote uh, the, uh, the price of one share at time t as st, and the stock price, uh, S0, is known to all investors. So we know the price of gold today, but um, the future price, um, S1, of gold tomorrow, or after tomorrow, it remains uncertain. And we can calculate the rate of return. So the rate of return is just how much um, capital we have generated from our stock by KS equals S1 minus uh, S0 uh, all over S0. And this will obviously uh, be uncertain depending on what the stock price is in the future. The risk-free position um, will be denoted by AT, and like the current bond price, A0, it is, um, uh, yeah, the current bond price, like the stock price, A0, is known to all investors, but um, uh, A1 is also known to all investors because this is risk-free, so we we definitely know the price um, our bond will have at time t equals one. And then the returns on the bond, which is the one we're certain on, is, is given by Ka equals um, A1 minus A0 all over A0. So we will know the rate of return of our bond. So this one's more kind of reliable, and it's usually the, the position um, less riskier clients would want to take if they wanted to invest money over time. So our task today, we wanted to build a mathematical model of uh, financial securities. But um, of course, with, with any model, uh, we will kind of need to make assumptions because the real world, especially with the markets, is just too complex. There are just too many factors to consider. So um, we kind of need to make a compromise between the complexity of the real world and the simplicity of the mathematical world in order to kind of be able to track down what is going on in um, with our financial securities through mathematics. So the first assumption is that the future stock price, S1, is a random variable with at least two different values. So remember I said that the stock price can either go up or down, and stock, stock can be anything. It can be oil, it can be any metal, uh, or even just um, shares of company. And then the future price, A1, which is our bond, is the risk-free security, is a no number. And obviously this is all random. We don't, we don't know um, what the stock price could be. So the positivity of prices. So the, it wouldn't make sense for an investor to buy something with a negative price because that would essentially mean that the... Um, and it wouldn't make sense for investors to sell something with a negative price because um, it would mean that they would be giving out money for you to take it on. So the price of the share and the price of the bond will, um, I mean, the price of the stock and the price of the bond will always be greater than zero. And as an investor, you kind of want a mixture of both stocks and bonds because um, bonds are reliable, whereas stock kind of give you hope for the greater return because of greater risk, you get greater returns. And then the total wealth of an investor can be calculated by VT equals XST plus Y80, and this is called the portfolio value. And it's, uh, yeah, so based on how many stocks you have and based how, on how many bonds you have, you can calculate uh, the total wealth of an investor at any given time T. And obviously, like with the stocks and the bonds, the portfolio is depending on what's happening with the stocks and the bonds. And um, obviously, you can you can have a variation of the um, the prices of the, the I mean the the total worth of the portfolio, and you will calculate it um, simply by subtracting the initial portfolio value from the. Uh, from the future portfolio value. So the difference, it may be positive, it may be zero or negative, 
um, as a fraction of the initial value represents the return on the portfolio. So that, so you can calculate the return from the portfolio as well. So just to see how well your portfolio is doing. And how the investor will choose to, how the investor decides whether it's worth investing in something or not, it really depends on what the client wants, whether the client is more um, happy to go with something that's riskier or whether they kind of want to steadily gain their capital in something that's more, you know, um, provides less capital quickly, but um, over time they're more happy with it. Um, and I want to go for an example of a portfolio value review, just so you kind of get an idea of how to kind of put these equations together and just give you an example of uh, a, like a, the amount of money a client has before and after and how they do. And those are the formulas which we refer to throughout the presentation. Um, so suppose that uh, your bond price at A0, at time t equals zero, is a hundred pound. Then, at t time equals one, we have a one is equal to hundred and ten pound, and we want to calculate the return of um, this risk-free position. So we just use the formula for k a, which we have on the board over there. So a one minus a zero all over a zero. And that would be 110 minus 100 all over 100. And that would be 0.1. Um, and then this implies that we have a 10% return of um, the bond. So the investor's done quite well. They managed to get 10% uh, return. Now let's look at um, if they were to invest in stock, what would happen? Um, so suppose at t time equals zero, we have the price of stock is 50 pound. And then at time um, t equals one, we would obviously have two values because we don't, we're not really sure how um, the stock will perform. So we're just gonna give it two values. It can even go up to 52 pound, or it can go down to 48 pound. And then the probability of it going to 52 pound will be P, and the probability of it going to uh, 48 pound will be P minus one, um, one minus P, I mean. And P will be between um, one and uh, zero. Then, if we wanted to calculate the return of the stock, we would do it in the same way, but of course we would have um, two different values because of the two different values of stock, um, and we would calculate it using KS. So we're not going to calculate out, but the, the answers are just um, 0 0.04 if the price of stock goes up to 52 pound, or it might be minus 0 0.04 if the price of stock were to go down. So that would be either 4% gain or 4% loss. Um, and suppose that um, we had this portfolio uh, of both stocks and bonds, and suppose we had uh, we had twenty stock shares, and we had ten. Um, so y equals ten bonds. Then, using the formula for port, uh, the portfolio of VT um, at time uh, t equals zero, we have um, the we have twenty stock shares at fifty pound plus we have ten bonds at hundred pound. And then altogether our portfolio will be two thousand pound. So this is at t time equals zero. Then um, we wanted to know how our uh, stocks are bonded together. So at t time equals one, we would have two values now because 
um, the stock went up or down. So we have 20 times 52 pound for our stock if it went up, and the, yeah, the 10 bonds became 110 pound, and that will give us um, 2,140 uh, pound if the stock were to go down, and if the stock were to, um, I mean, the stock were to go up, and if the stock were to go down, um, we would calculate it in the same way, but just with the lower uh, stock price, and then it would be uh, 2,060 if it were to go down. So the total return of the portfolio um, will be given by KV, and KV will just be 0.07 if it goes up and 0.03 if it were to go down. So either 7% or 3%. So we see that the portfolio remains to be positive and this is one of the key assumptions that we will um, have. As an investor, you don't want to be losing money. So you will always have these um, stable bonds which will always kind of give you some income, whether it's small or uh, larger, depending on how your stocks do, at least you won't be negative. I want to talk to you more about um, uh, more assumptions that we make in these, this model. So the assumption is of divisibility, liquidity and short selling. So almost perfect divisibility is achieved in real world dealings whenever the volume of transactions is large as compared to the unit prices. Um, liquidity means any asset can be bought or sold on demand at the market price in arbitrary quantities. This is clearly a mathematical idealization because in practice there exist restrictions on the volume of trading you can have. Um, before I talk about short selling, I want to kind of give you the idea of what it means to have like a short trade or a long trade. You go, you enter long trades, um, it's the classic method of buying with the intention of profiting from a rising market. So if you buy, for example, Microsoft, um, you assume that it's going to do well. So you want to profit from uh, Microsoft doing well. Um, short trades are entered with the intention of profiting from a falling market. So right now there are more short trades going on because the market is um, kind of it's quite volatile. It's not doing so well. And... Um, the short position is a directional trading or investment strategy where the investment, uh, investor, investor sells shares of borrowed stock in the open market. The um, expectation of the investor is that the price of the stock will decrease over time, at which point um, he will purchase the shares in the open market and return the shares to the broker which he borrowed them from. So if you're an investor and you're like, um, oh no, oil is not doing so well, I've got uh, shares of oil, you want to sell it back to the investor and then you, you, want, you want it to do worse because you predicted that it will do worse and you buy it back at cheaper rates. So that's what, short, um, that's what the short position is. And then the long position is, um, is buying uh, security such as stock, commodity or currency or the expectation that the asset will rise. So you bought the um, pound and you predict that it's going to do well. Um, another assumption is uh, solvency, and I kind of touched about it with my example, is that the wealth of an investor uh, must be negative at all times, so we need to kind of balance the bonds with the stocks, so that um, uh, the negativity of the stock, if it were to go down, kind of is counteracted by the uh, positivity of the bond. Um, and if it satisfies, then a just term for it would be admissible. Uh, one more assumption is um, in the real world, the number of possible different prices is finite because they are quoted to within a specified number of decimal places and because there is only a certain final amount of money in the whole world supplying an upper bound for all prices. So the price of Apple wouldn't really tend to infinity. Like It's a great company, it's doing really well, but it's never gonna, it's always going to have an upper bound for how well it can do can't really sell for, it can, be, it can be worth billions of billions of pounds, but it will always have this upper bound. Um, so, 
we've talked about how much um, we get when we invest in something, um, but how do we choose uh, um, how and when to invest in it? And this is where I kind of wanted you to kind of step in and kind of think about how, how, how much risk you take on a day-to-day -day basis yourself. And this is, this is kind of, this can be kind of, obviously as a mathematical model, you kind of have to break it down. There's obviously other things um, that factor into this, but it has a lot to do with probability. And um, this is what investors do use probability when they're deciding on uh, how much they should invest in. And uh, we will be discussing the Kelly Criterion model as it contributes to the amount investors choose to invest in something. And you all probably heard of a coin flip, so you just flip a coin in the air and uh, you, it lands on your hand and um, it can either be heads or tails. Usually the coin is supposed to be have a 50-50 chance of either landing on heads or tails. Um, but suppose that in our experiment, the probability of heads is 0 0.6 and the probability of tails is 0 0.4. How much would you invest your money in if it were to land on heads? And how much, or would you invest your money that it would land in tails? It's more, it would seem more sensible to invest your money on it landing on heads because the probability is greater. But there's a lot more to it than just um, investing any arbitrary amounts of money. And a paper was actually written by two uh, fund managers. And the paper invited 61 people, a combination of college age students in finance and economics, and some young professionals at finance firms, including 14 who worked for fund managers to take a test. They were each given a stake of $25 and then asked to bet on a coin that would land head 60% of the time. So the prize is real, although capped at $250. So they wanted to conduct the experiment um, the maximum you could win was $250, but every time you'd bet a certain portion of your money that it will land on heads uh, or it will land on tails. And this experiment really gave you a good idea on how uh, people invest in the real world. And that's an American dollar. Um, and these were the instructions given on the paper. Um, uh, so it was an online test, and there was a... Um, uh, coin. It was a coin simulated. It was a simulator. A simulator of a coin, and it was flipped, and uh, it either had heads or tails. And I tried it myself before I kind of had any strategy. I just wanted to get a kind of idea on what I would get if I didn't kind of just threw myself in there. What kind of investor I was, and I was quite cautious at first because I didn't kind of. I wanted to get a feel of how well um, the coin was doing, whether it was gonna land on heads most of the time, or tails. Um, I thought that it landed on heads quite frequently because obviously it was 0 0.6 probability. So I started um, betting more money onto it. And then um, I did quite well. It, it, was, um, it was quite a lot of patience involved because um, they asked you, it was, a, it was for half an hour. And each time I thought it was doing really well, there was obviously a step where I got too confident and I got tails, so I lost a bit of money. But overall, I did well. And if you guys want to um, ha have a go, I decided to um, attach the link to the test as well. It's still up there. You don't actually win any money now. The test is over. But it's still quite interesting to see. But we will actually look at a strategy that will involve um, that, is, that is probably like the best way to uh, bet money. And probably that, that way you can get the maximum amount of money. So what were the results? So 28% of the participants lost all their money, and the average payout was just $91. So um, only 21% part, uh, of the participants reached the maximum. 18 of the 61 uh, participants bet everything on one toss, while two thirds gambled on tails at some stage of the experiment. So quite a lot of people were quite bullish at one point. That's just a term people use that when they're quite confident and they want to invest a lot of money in something and they just lost everything um so yeah th that wasn't really i guess there wasn't really a strategy that people use based on the figures but we will we will find out the best strategy to use so uh what was the right strategy to play so maybe you maybe there's there it does have a lot of 
to do with initiative and obviously there's uh, luck and chance to do with it but there's also a strategy that you can follow that kind of um, maximizes your uh, your money that you will get out of, out of it and this strategy is called the Kelly criterion model and it's basically um, it's named after a researcher at Bell's Labs, and it is well known to gamblers as a way to decide how much to bet when the odds are in your favor. So in our coin flip, the probability of it landing on heads was 0 0.6. So um, suppose that of probability P, so we have P, um, you make a profit uh, to the times that you bet, um, otherwise you lose the bet. So um, the profit you make is the, the B. Um, in our experiment is P is equal to 0 0.6, so that's the probability of it um, landing on heads. B is uh, the total probabilities, so um, it's 0 0.4 plus 0 0.6. Uh, if I just were to write it down here, so P is 0 0.6, B would be 0 0.4 plus 0 0.6, that's the total probability. And then calculating it using the formula, we'd get 0 0.6 times by 1 minus 1 minus 0 0.6 well, over 1. That's 0 0.6 minus 0 0.4, which equals to 0 0.2. So what does that tell us? That tells us that with the amount, the total amount of money we have to bet, we should bet 20% um, of it. And how did we get this formula? Well, there is the mathematics behind it. So um, in this case, our investment strategy is going to multiply our net worth in each round by a random variable x. If our starting net wo um, worth is w0, then our worth wn after n rounds will be w multiplied by x1, x2, x all the way up to xn, where um, x1 to xn are the n random outcomes of our bets. So we have uh, Wn, and that's given by W0 multiplied by all of the x's. And obviously they're multiplied, and we don't really know how to deal with multiplication. But we do know that we can use logs to convert it to additions for our uh, bets. So we use our uh, properties of log here. And then we have it in like an additional form which we can use. Um, after several kind of um, rearranging, um, we know that this will eventually this will, uh, disappear. Uh, zero one will disappear because it will gradually get smaller and smaller and smaller um, as our random variables uh, increases. And then. If we were to, we wanted to bet some of our money, not all of our money, we would um, we would bet. This is like the amount that we would want to bet, and then um, to be to be able to maximize um, betting some of our money, we would want to um, derive it here, and then set it equal to zero. Because obviously, um, using like simple calculus. You, to maximize something, you would want to equate it to zero to get uh, the maximum amount of money uh, from your bet. And here we have our formula, which we saw earlier on. So it's quite interesting to see how mathematics plays a role in how the best way um, in betting. And this is the model demonstrating it. Um, although we talked about gambling, this, this is actually used for um, by investors as a money management strategy. So the Kelly criterion has enabled gamblers to maximize the size of their bankroll over the, over the long term. But today, many people use it as a general money management system, not only for gambling, but also for um, investing. Um, you, you can do this yourself, actually, if, you, if, you've got, like, if you've got some stock. You assess your last 50 to 60 stocks and the Kelly criterion assumes that you will trade in the future as you have traded in the past. And um, instead of uh, the B we had in the formula earlier on, um, we have this win-loss ratio, and you calculate this win-loss ratio by the average gain of positive trades 
all over the average loss of negative trades. And this kind of tells you the size of position you should take with your future trades. And it tells you how much to invest in. I just to conclude, um, Although we have seen some models and we do we have like a general idea of how we should invest in and when we should invest in and how much. Um, the system, it will help you diversify your portfolio efficiently, but there are some things that it just can't do. It cannot pick winning stocks for you. Um, it can't make you continue to trade consistently, consistently, consistently or predict sudden market crashes. It's just not able to do that because obviously the world is complicated and you've got all kinds of, you've got geophysical of, um, events affecting the markets, you've got geopolitical um, political events affecting the market. So there is obviously a lot that it can't do. And obviously I showed you a very basic case, obviously there's a lot more complicated ones, but it does give you an idea and it does kind of show you how maths plays a role in it. And also, there's also always a, a certain amount of luck or randomness in the markets, which can alter your returns. And this luck or randomness is not predicted by anyone. You're not, you, you don't even know what kind of luck you will have in a couple of years' time. So, although it does diversify your portfolio, um, it, it can't do everything. But diversifying your portfolio is key to limiting losses, and the Kelly Criterion model is just one of the many models to help you do this. So thank you very much, and I hope I've given you some ideas about what you should do with your money. Thank you. Okay, thank you for coming, everyone. Does anyone have any questions for Diana? <coughs> Sorry, wasn't IPO? IPO, so if you've got a, a company who kind of just started out, and they want to kind of grow their business, um, they, was, they would sell shares of their company to investors, and um, the, obviously the invest other people will pay for the shares and over time um, you as a company have to pay out dividends, something called dividends, and that's basically just payouts. Thank you for investing in me, I'm doing well, here's some money for investing in me. And if you wanted to, you could buy, always buy back the shares if you wanted to own 100% of your company, but if you didn't have the initial funds, then you would ask other people to invest in you so that you are able to grow. Anyone else? Uh, in which case, I'll, I'll ask a question to you. Yeah. Um, do you, you mentioned at the start uh, the Tesla thing. Do you have like a favourite case study, one that you, you find really interesting? I, I don't know. There's a, everything's interesting. I don't know, because it's always interesting to know um, what's happening, who's merging. But I, I mentioned the Tesla one because I don't know. I'm just, I'm, I like that idea of uh, a sustainable future. And obviously, if an electric company, car company, is using solar, pa solar panels, in that kind of technology, like you can even have like solar panels on top of a car. Um, it's, it's, al it's always like great to see kind of these kind of investments happening for the future. So, yeah. Has anyone thought of a question in the intervening time? If not, let's uh, thank Diana again. And uh, actually, before you, so two weeks' time, Joanne will be speaking. Do we have a title yet, Joanne? Yeah, it's called Will the Sun Rise Tomorrow? So it's more based on like. Uh, Following from the randomness and the statistics that was in this talk, it's about Bayesian statistics, which probably won't have seen before, but it's um, a different way that we can look at different way that we can model parameters. So, yeah. It should be really good. We hope to see lots of you there. If you enjoyed this one, I'm sure you'll like that one too. So, thanks all for coming, and we'll thank Diana once more, and then have a great day. Oh, good morning. Thank you. There are still some drinks here if anyone wants to. That too. <laughs> <laughs>